The Holy See uh, appointed me in, in August of 2016 to the Pontifical Commission for the Study of the Diaconate of Women. <clears throat> it was an interesting event because uh, for a month I kept saying, you know, I read this in the paper, but I haven't heard from you guys. Um, so they said, we don't know your address. So uh, in September, I got a beautiful letter from the Secretary of State, Cardinal Paroline, inviting me, I think it invites me, it's in Italian, uh, to be a member of the commission. And we met in November of 2016 for the first time. And at that commission uh, meeting, where, as, as the lady said, the 50% uh, male and 50% female, and I, I've just been told, I didn't know this, it's the first commission in the history of the church uh, to be 50-50 uh, like that. And uh, I was the only person asked to attend from outside Europe. And uh, I was nominated uh, by the International Union of Superiors General, the sisters who actually asked the Holy Father, could we have a commission? And he said yes to them in public and then privately said, give us your uh, give eight nominees. So I was one of eight nominated by UISG and one of, I think, three or four chosen from that side of the street. And then uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was asked for nominees. And they, uh, uh, they I think, got four. And from my count, I think four were just picks of the Holy Father. Uh, I, I have no, uh, uh, no idea where they came from. <clears throat> One's better than the other. Um, the woman who is the chairman of the uh, Department of Theology of the Pontifical Gregorian University was, was on the commission, Sister Mary Maloney, the first female rector of, a, uh, of the Antonianum, but the first female rector of a pontifical theologate in Rome was on the commission, a um, uh, member of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, uh, a, uh, uh, a professor from Sapientia, which is the uh, which is the, uh, uh, the Harvard of Rome, and uh, a woman who can translate uh, from German into Latin and was Cardinal Mueller's graduate assistant. So that, that's, the, that's the female side of the street, and, and the men were um, equally talented and equally uh, well-known in Rome. Uh, there was a, uh, an African man who's a professor at the uh, Silesianum. He's a professor of ecclesiology. There was a... Uh, actually, an American <clears throat> who was a professor of patristics at the Augustinianum. There's a, a Belgian Jesuit who is a professor of ecclesiology and a psychologist, and he was actually here in Fordham, Fordham with me, uh, Bernard Poitier uh, from Belgium. Um, there was uh, Monsignor Coda, who was a dean from, of Sophia University in, in Florence. I'm, I'm forgetting one uh, from Spain. And I'm forgetting Menke, uh, who was a, a professor from Bonn. And the chairman is, was Cardinal, was at the time Archbishop Ladaria, who was the secretary. That's the number two uh, in, the, uh, in the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And he was an archbishop, he's a Jesuit. And when Cardinal Mueller's term of office was up at, at the end of uh, uh, 20, June 2016, uh, Ladaria eventually was, was named as, as the, uh, uh, or actually the end of 2017, Ladaria was named as the uh, prefect of, of the congregation. So we met a couple of times. Uh, at the first meeting, I, I volunteered to be everybody's teaching assistant because it became pretty obvious that I was the only one who'd done substantial work on the topic. And that was, that was voted. And I said, I, 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 you know, I don't care which side of the street you're on, I, I'll uh, I can move to Rome, and I said I will. Would, I said to Cardinal Adaria, I will move to Rome next winter and work here, and people can because everybody else mostly lived in Rome, uh, one from Florence, one from Belgium, a uh, couple from Germany, but really everybody else was living in Rome. <clears throat> and I said, but I want to live in the Casa Santa Marta, and he said, just give your dates to my secretary. It's <laughs> <was> like okay. <laughs> so, so I was able to live with the Holy Father's house for two months uh, in, at the beginning. I had already lived for a week, there for a week. And over the past two and a half years, I, I lived in the Holy Father's house for four and a half months, um, which was an experience in and of itself. Um, and it was uh, quite obvious, if there are any religious here, it's kind of like being in the novitiate, because you know they're looking at you. And uh, it, it, it was, but it was a very good experience, because every cardinal in the world comes through there. 
uh, bishops and cardinals from all over the place. So it was an extraordinary experience um, to be at table with these men. And of course, all day long, I would, I would work in the Vatican Library, just kind of run around the back of St. Peter's and go to the library or take the bus down to the Gregoriana and sit in the basement and sneeze while I was reading manuscripts and old books. So um, uh, that's what I did. And I was asked by the Holy See not to give any public lectures during the term of the, uh, of the uh, commission. And I said, okay, you know, um, it, it, would, it would look <clears throat> like I was either, you know, telling stories about what was going on or um, criticizing the Holy Father, criticizing the Pope. I, I didn't need to do that. And besides, I had all this work to do for the commission. I didn't have time to be getting on airplanes going all over the place, which is what I'm starting to do now. So um, this, I think, is my sister Irene's in the back, uh, but I think she'll remember this is just my second public lecture since, uh, since I was able to start speaking. And I'm very grateful to Father Dufel for the invitation um, to come. And I'm uh, very grateful for you to come out um, to, to hear about what went on. Um, what I'm gonna do is talk for, I guess, about another half hour or uh, uh, 40 minutes. What time do we get thrown out? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I won't, won't keep you too long. What, what I want to do is to give you some, uh, tell you a little bit more about the topic and then uh, the ladies have, uh, Jackie, and uh, they have uh, uh, index cards. And uh, did you pass them out? We'll do it right now. Yeah, they'll pass out some index cards, and as you have questions, if you would, uh, if you would just write down your questions legibly, please, and and we'll just see what we can what we can do with the questions. If you want, if you don't want to have questions, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's just that if you if you have questions, I'd be happy to to field them for you. Um, I don't know if I have enough cards, but if you'd share anyway. Um, so the Holy Father's decision to establish this commission uh, for the study of the diaconate of women, which is the formal name of the commission, in August of 2016. He was asked in May by the sisters, and in August 2nd, 2016, I happened to go into my office early, and I had a whole bunch of emails, and I saw one from Father Tom Rosique at Salt and Light TV, and it was all in Italian and he's congratulating me all over the place. And I said, I didn't know what was going on. I said, oh, that's nice, they have a commission. <clears throat> and it was an alphabetical order, so at the end was my name. And, and uh, it was uh, 8.30 in the morning, I was, uh, it was summer, I had just run up to get my mail, and that started two and a half days of media, but then I did no more media after that. And I had, uh, and even the UISG sisters said they were pretty surprised that I was, uh, uh, I was chosen. Um, because, <clears throat> as has been said, well, we know what you think, you know, so. Uh, so, but the question then comes, then what do we know about women deacons, all right? Um, well, first of all, we know they existed, all right? There, there's a lot of literary evidence, there's epigraphical evidence, there's historical evidence. We know that women deacons ministered in the West at least to the 12th century, okay? Now, that they existed creates three questions, all right? First, what do we know about the ceremonies, the liturgies that the bishops use to create women deacons? Secondly, what do we know about their tasks and duties? What do they do? And, and what do we know about the theology of the diaconate that, that would either admit or restrict women from the diaconal ordination. So these are the three things I'm gonna talk about. You know, the liturgies, you know, how they were created, uh, what they did, uh, and then what is the theological discussion here now about whether they can be readmitted uh, to the order of deacon. Uh, so, the liturgical ceremonies. You know, a liturgy is, is uh, is liturgy of the work of the people. So a liturgy is, is the ceremonial act by which the church does something. And, and the liturgi liturgical ceremonies apparently used by, by bishops in the past for the creation of women as deacons uh, are evidence. They're in manuscripts. They're in fourth to, from the fourth to the 16th century. 
um, their original ceremonies and then they're copied and copied and copied and copied. So we have books that exist in the, or manuscripts in the fourth century, fifth century, sixth century, eighth century. Uh, then they get copied into books. Then they get copied into more books. So, so we have all this evidence there. Um, and some of the rituals, not all of them, but some of the rituals include all of the elements of a sacramental ordination according to the criteria of the Council of Trent, okay? You know, the Council of Trent, 16th century, let's get everything right. Well, <clears throat> there have been people who have investigated this, including myself, and the criteria are there. Now, the earliest ordination uh, ritual for women, as called the Keratonia, ritual for women deacons is found in the uh, Apostolic Constitutions. These are fourth century, and, and what this ceremony does, it directs the bishop to lay hands on her in the presence of the presbyterate, all the priests, the deacons, the women deacons, and to pray a prayer that's parallel. By parallel, I mean they say her instead of him, <laughs> okay? They say she instead of a he, a parallel to the one for the ordination of a deacon. Now, including the ep epiclesis, or the epiclesis, as they tell me I'm supposed to say it. That means the epiclesis, the calling down of the Holy Spirit. So now we have something that the Pope, that the bishop is doing, and after he does this, okay, he gives her a stole. The candidate, the woman deacon, is named in the succession of biblical prophets, uh, Marie, Deborah, Anna, Hulda, and God is asked, oh dear, this is in, I wrote it in French, um, the, is, asked, is asked to, um, to maintain her always, uh, to maintain her servant always, uh, and, and, and to choose her to be a deacon, okay? And to give her the Holy Spirit and purify everything that she does and keep her pure in, in the flesh, in, in her body, and in her spirit. And the ordaining uh, bishop, as I said, places a stole around her neck, and he calls her a deacon, okay? Now, you know today that if you call a plumber and a female shows up, you do not call her a plumberess, right? <laughs> he calls her a deacon, all right? As language accrues, we find that certain languages start having deaconesses, you know, like you have stewardesses, okay? uh, la professoressa, okay, in Italian. So um, the confusion happens because some deaconesses are the wives of deacons or the wives of beach, uh, bishops. But in any event, there are women, and I call them women deacons, and, and, and they are, uh, uh, they're there. There are other rituals in a lot of manuscripts, east and west, okay? Uh, the, in the Vatican, the Apostolic Library has three uh, from the east. Uh, the famous Barberini 336, there's a Vatican manuscript, um, there's a Syriac, Syriac manuscript, uh, and then there are also two from the west. Uh, uh, one, from <clears throat> one from more kind of France, and the other one from basically Luca um, in, 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 uh, in Italy. Uh, there's one, and there's one from Paris as well. Um, but they all are called the Ordo a Diaconum Faciandum, the, the making of, of deacons. Um, and there are plenty others, okay, in other libraries, in Italy and in Austria, in England and France and in Germany. Um, so that these manuscripts are all over the place. Uh, it's not a single manuscript. It's not a single ceremony. In some cases, you'll find, as I said earlier, a ceremony will have been copied. Um, so it went from the fourth century to the fifth century in the same book. Uh, but then you have other, other ceremonies uh, in different places. We have one uh, uh, in the eighth century, uh, a guy named Egbert of York. Uh, and, and that's one where it is absolutely parallel uh, because the instructions are, if it's a female, if it's a male, you know, you do this, you do this. So, now, there's no doubt women deacons existed, but there are a lot of different opinions as to the nature of their ordinations already. They say, oh, he didn't, didn't ordain women, you know. Um, 
uh, they, they were just blessed. Uh, they, were, they weren't really ordained. And uh, I said, well, but if you do the same thing, what's happening? Is the Holy Spirit saying, I can't do it, it's a girl? I mean, it, it, makes, it makes no sense to me. Um, and the other thing is, the term blessed, ordained, consecrated, these terms are used interchangeably. Um, there's a, 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 a synod in France uh, where they say, if a priest has been blessed, he can no longer sleep with his wife. I'm not going to go there, but, but the, uh, the term is blessed, which is the same as, as ordained. Now, um, in most cases, in most cases, as I said, these are really identical. And then, then there are, there's the confusion because there are two Greek terms. One says blessed, one says ordained, and then they use them interchangeably. Uh, now, <clears throat> People have been fighting about this for a long time. Uh, we've had women deacons, really they kind of died out in the 12th, 12th century, I'll talk more about that. Uh, but after Trent, there was discussion. At Trent there was discussion about restarting, re-upping the diaconate, and naturally there had been discussion about re-upping the diaconate with women, just as there was in the Second Vatican Council. Uh, but Around the time of Trent, people started looking into women deacons, and there was a, a man named Jean Morin who read, and I've seen the book, big book, uh, all of the, um, he collected all of the, the ordination ceremonies from, from Syria, in, in Syriac, he, he, he collected them in Greek, and he collected them in, in Latin. He went through all of them, and his determination was these rituals met the criteria for sacramental ordination, as I said earlier, according to the Council of Trent. A hundred years later, so this is how long the discussion is going on, another professor, Jean Pien, looks and says, um, well, even though there's evidence that they were ordained with the laying on of hands and included in epiclesis, um, they couldn't be considered sacramental. Why? Well, it's women. Mm -hmm. So the debate continued. In 1972, it came up again. A professor named Roger Grisa, who's Belgian, he found positively that women deacons were ordained, and uh, others agreed. Members of the International Theological Commission agreed. But after about 10 years of back and forth, a man named Ami Georges Marimort, uh, who was a bishop, actually argued negatively. So the fight was on. The discussion um, was now held however, against the backdrop of the call for women priests. And that just confused things um, because, and, and, and perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps I say, because the Second Vatican Council affirmed the sacramental nature of diaconal ordination, um, even as it was distinct from presbyteral ordination, there were a few people following Marty Mort saying, no, 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 women, no, 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 can't have women. Uh, and you, you can hear what's starting to happen here. If you're going to ordain her a deacon, you can ordain her a priest. And some people like that, <laughs> some people really don't. And that's where the collision began. More recently, there were two um, uh, uh, quinquenia, quinquenia of the International Theological Commission. They named people for five-year terms, and they began to study. Uh, study in 1992, I can remember Cardinal O'Connor telling me in 1994, there were secret discussions going on in Rome about women deacons, but they can't figure out how to have a woman deacon and not have a woman priest. And I said, Eminence, I'm not allowed to talk about women priests. He said, oh, that's very good. <laughs> he said, make that chapter four in your book. So, uh, uh, which I did. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, he out helped me outline the book, so what am I going to do? He challenged me to write the book, actually. But anyway, by all accounts, there was a 17-page document completed in 1997, okay? And what it said was, yeah, women deacons are no big deal. You can ordain them. However, that was a document of the International Theological Commission. The president of the International Theology Commission, Theological Commission was the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith at the time. The prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith at the time was one Joseph Ratzinger. And he refused to sign it. And he created, because he was the prefect, he created a new sub, they had a new five-year term group. He created a new subcommittee making one of his former graduate students the chair of the subcommittee. 
And the subcommittee now had a 17-page document, which became 78 pages. Right? And what they basically said was, we don't know. Okay. Uh, the ITC uh, produced a 78-page document, the Diaconate Evolution and Perspectives. This is the conclusion. The deaconesses mentioned in the tradition of the ancient church as evidenced by the right of institution and the functions they exercise were not purely and simply the, the equivalent of deacons, number one. Number two, the unity of the sacrament of holy orders in the clear distinction between the ministries of the bishop and the priests on the one hand and the diaconal ministry on the other is strongly underlined by ecclesial tradition, especially in the teaching of the magisterium. So in light of these elements, which have been set out in the present historico-theological research document, it pertains to the ministry of discernment, which the Lord established in his church to pronounce authoritatively on this question. Well, what does that mean? That means we're going to kick down the can down the road, put it upstairs, hope the Pope says something. Who's the Pope? John Paul II. Okay, nothing happened. Who's the next Pope? Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, nothing happened. So now we're back, and the sisters at the end of their triennial assembly almost three years ago said, uh, excuse me? And he, they, he, he, they were asked to submit six questions in advance. This is how the questions happened. They have what are called constellations, which are uh, territories around the world. They have about 1,500 members. So these are sisters who are the general superiors of about 1,500 different institutes of women religious. They, they got in uh, and boiled, they got in about 26. Then the constellations would send in questions, uh, and then they boiled them down to six. And they were managed to get everyone into one of those six categories. They gave them to the Pope three months in advance, or three, three months in advance, and the first two were about women um, uh, women in ministry, specifically women in the diaconate. So uh, he knew. Uh, the point being, he didn't just walk into an assembly with 900 nuns in front of him and all of a sudden be surprised uh, about this. So he knew what he was going to say. He knew how he was going to answer it. So the operative points, while historically women deacons do not appear to have been precisely identical to men deacons, the church also distinguishes between the sacerdotal ministry, the presbyterate, the priesthood, and the diaconate, the diaconal ministries on this hand. So the two different ministries, due benaro, uh, and therefore the ministry, uh, and, and the ministry of discernment should allow the church to pronounce authoritatively on the question of women deacons. The ITC did not say no. They just didn't say yes. I was told many years ago, I want to say 25 years ago, by the most senior woman in Rome at the time, she said, um, they can't say no, they just don't want to say yes. Uh, and, and that was their problem. So nearly a generation of additional research, uh, mine and that of others, again has brought this question to the fore. So, we know there were women deacons. What'd they do? Okay. What'd they do? I mean, why would the bishop, first of all, bother having a ceremony and ordaining a woman if he didn't know that he wanted them to do something. So uh, one response restricts their tasks to baptism of women, okay? Baptism by immersion, um, either with a, 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 like a veil on or a, a cloth and a, or, or nude. Um, and, and I'm here to tell you, I've been in one of those baptismal pools in Pazzuoli in, in, uh, in Italy, it's dangerous. <laughs> Okay, because it's concentric circles of stone, no railings. Um, so you do need people to help you and they're gonna to be touching you. And there's also the, the chrismation and the anointing. And so um, we agree, women deacons, uh, women deacons helped with baptism, okay? Uh, men deacons really didn't do that much in baptism, if anything, because the bishop was there. Uh, I've read uh, baptismal ceremonies from this era, maybe the sixth century, and it's really funny. They put up um, a veil, uh, a screen, a kind of a, a, well, it's a curtain, between the baptismal pool and the bishop, 
and the woman deacon does everything in the pool and the bishop sticks his hand through the, <laughs> through the veil and, and blesses. Um, I, I, I had the worst time translating that. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, but, uh, so anyway, um, we know that they did that, but we also know that they anointed and carried communion to ill women, okay? And that's a very important point because um, I, I, don't have, I don't have any evidence of men anointing. Um, people ask me about it, I said, well, for further information, please consult Epiphanius, but, but th there's a, a Danielou, uh, Jean Cardinal Danielou, in, in studying this, he felt that it was a sacramental anointing of ill women. But the idea of women deacons carrying the Eucharist is very, very important because they're carrying the sacred, they're touching the sacred, and we'll get, we'll get to that in a little bit. In general, because women deacons ministered until the 12th century in the West, and even longer in the East, their known tasks and duties vary. Everybody didn't do the same thing in the same place at the same time. Part of it's cultural, part of it's what the bishop wants, okay? Um, so then accepting this request of the UISG, the Holy Father gave his own evidence of his recollection of what women deacons did. Very interesting. He said, yeah, they, they anointed in baptism and they assisted women whose husbands claim, who claimed their husbands beat them. I said, what? What he said was he, rec he recalled a Syrian professor, professor of Syriac studies saying that when a woman was accusing her husband of beating her, she would go to the woman deacon and the woman deacon would examine the bruises and the woman deacon would then give her testimony, give the testimony to the bishop. Well, that's kind of a shorthanded annulment there. And you have a woman deacon very much involved in this, and who else could give the testimony anyway? You know, um, and and this is what the Holy Father said to the nuns. Now, uh, it's it's impossible to state generally what women deacons did or did not do, precisely because there are differing customs, there are differing practices across the churches, um, across the centuries. We don't know who did what at every time. The deacon is charged, we know, to the ministry of the word, the liturgy, and the charity, but, but these things changed and evolved and actually eroded. Um, <clears throat> for example, the, the roles of the deacon at the mass are progressively refused to women. Okay. How do we know they're refused? Because the bishops and popes start complaining that women are doing these things. In the fifth century, we have a pope named Gelasius, who's saying that the women are serving the altar as did men, with impatience. We have heard that divine things have undergone such contempt that women are encouraged to serve at the sacred altars and that all the tasks entrusted to the service of men are performed by a sex for which these tasks are not appropriate. Scandalous. In the sixth century, we have three Gallic bishops uh, jointly complaining about this because these women are holding the chalices and presuming to administer the blood of Christ to the people of God. In the ninth century, we have the Council of Paris, which really is the one that gives us the best anti-female evidence. In some provinces, in contradiction to the divine law and to canonical instruction, women betake themselves into the altar area and impudently take hold of the sacred vessels. Hold on to priests, hold out the priestly garments to the priests, and what is still worse, most indecent and unfitting that all this they give the body and blood of the Lord and do other things which in themselves are indecent. So there. <laughs> the rejection of women touching sacred species or vessels hardened and it spread, mostly in the West, but boy, it hardened and spread even after women were no longer ordained as deacons. In, in Basque country, however, we find that the duties of women deacons are still carried out to this day. But the synod in the